Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the damn sofa. That's the damn sofa, and that's my damn little sassy sidekick, Roscoe, and my damn name's Paul. Today, we are going to be talking about a very in-depth case. So, go ahead and buckle up your seatbelts, because it is going to be a rough ride. And so, what I wanted to do is kind of look at a different perspective on some cases like this. You know, recently at this channel, we've looked at Chandler Halderson, Joe, Joel Guy Jr., uh, Grant Amato. And so, today I wanted to look at the story of a young lady who was at the center of, you know, deception, lies, secret life, forbidden love, all of the stuff, you name it, who decided that the best way to get what she wanted was to implement a, pan to, a plan to wipe out her parents off of the face of the earth. Okay, and uh, obviously, thank God it didn't work completely, although, you know, one person would lose their life in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to be reviewing the story of Jennifer Pan. We're going to be reviewing some of the uh, footage from her interviews that she did with police, which were very fascinating, and just going over some of the details of that case. So if you can identify yourself for me. My name is Jennifer Pan. Can you spell your last name, Jennifer? P-A-N. Pan. Pan. So for this video, I listened to the audiobook. It's called A, Do a Daughter's Deadly Deception by Jeremy Grimaldi. I'll put a link down in the description below. It was excellent. It went completely into all of the different layers of this story, y'all. I mean, and there are so many different layers. Uh, but it was an easy listen. I'm sure it was an easy read if you prefer reading. Uh, so I definitely suggest it. Again, the links are in the description for that. Now, also, if you like my channel here, make sure you're subscribed to it. Uh, that way you'll get notifications, things of that nature. I also have other channels. I have my podcast channel, which is a little bit more relaxed. I go over like headlines, updates, things like that. I go live over there sometimes. Uh, that link is in the description. And I also have a movie reviewer channel. Um, I'm not as active on that one, but I do post uh, things about that I'm watching and things of that nature. Usually horror films, stuff like that. That link is down below as well. Now, this video might be broken down into a couple of parts it depends on how long it goes and the way you're gonna know is because it'll say so on the damn thumbnail so if it doesn't say part one then this is one video if it says part one then part two is coming uh, but at the time of this filming I just don't know I just feel like it might be a really long one so we'll see um, so anyways with all that being said before we 100% dive into this hot mess let's make some damn room on the damn sofa for our damn sponsor y'all welcome hello fresh back to the sofa for this month oh well, let's welcome hello fresh back to the sofa. It's springtime and it's time for a spring refresh. Y'all know I'm getting ready to head to Vegas, so I've been watching my calories and trying new dishes. This week's box had some awesome options. HelloFresh is the first carbon neutral meal kit company and nearly all the packaging is recyclable. We've got meatloaf a la mom, love the name, citrus pork tacos, and Italian chicken over lemon spaghetti. That's what I'm going to be cooking tonight and it's going to be so awesome. Now, if y'all have followed me for a while, then you know I work as well as do YouTube. HelloFresh never gets in the way of my busy days. I can stay on track with eating clean with simple recipes and fresh pre-portioned ingredients that cut out mealtime prep and trips to the grocery store. Just look at the ingredients. It's exactly what you need. There's way less food waste, which equals to more money in our pockets. Don't waste money on food that you don't need. The weather here has been so amazing. The easy directions that come in each meal kit cut down on time in the kitchen, which equals to more time spent outside having fun doing your own thing. So we had last minute travel plan changes that ended up having for Matt to stay home. So we adjusted the serving sizes in our box this week and that made the meal planning for the days that I'm not gonna be here so much easier. HelloFresh Market means you've got a one-stop shop for all meal and snack occasions with items like focaccia pizza, satisfying sides, and drool-worthy desserts. HelloFresh recipes feature produce that goes from the farm to your front door in under a week, which means their spring menu features the season's freshest flavors. So y'all, I ended up serving one of my friends dinner once they got into town, and they're not used to seeing me be so domesticated, I'm not gonna lie. But not only were they floored that I was serving up these dishes, but the taste won them over too. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code reporting live for my sofa 16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code reporting live for my sofa 16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. 
Okay, so we're going to begin the story with the day of the tragic events. So let's go back in time to that day, the day of the event, and let's start looking at her immediate family and what was going on that day at the Pan residence. So the family consisted of Jennifer, as we know, uh, her younger brother Felix, her mother Bick, and her father Han. And so the day of these events that took place, uh, first of all, her, her younger brother Felix, thank God, was away at college, so he was not there. So one thing that was really like ominous about this situation for that day is Jennifer would say that her and her mother were going to like go out and run some errands or something like that, but the streets were cordoned off by the police because there was a gas leak or something like that. And so they decided to stay home and that part just was very eerie to me, right? And so they stay home. And so later when they can leave or whatever, Jennifer decides to stay back. She's going to like practice piano or something or do some homework or whatever. Uh, and so they go their own ways and her mother goes and does her own thing. Um, so now later on, they would eat dinner together, her and her mother. And afterwards, her mother would go and study the Vietnamese news. Uh, or she would go and not study it. She would go into the study to read the Vietnamese news. Uh, I'm just reading some of my notes here on this computer in front of me. So pardon me if I just look down at it from time to time. Um, now, after dinner, one of Jen's friends would come over for dinner. And another eerie part to this whole case is they were like, you know what? There was like absolutely no sign from Jen of what was to come like later that evening, right? like she was just totally normal um so that's even scarier because one thing about this case and this stuck out to me is uh how just you know emotionless she was about it right there's parts of it i didn't know what to believe was fake or real or whatever in regards to like some of the interview stuff that we'll get into uh but just like her kind of calculated way that she went about things was very eerie to me so anyways friend comes over you know they're like look she didn't show any signs that this was you know mastermind plan was getting ready to take place so there's that now later on jen would go to her room she would be on the phone she'd be doing stuff like that now her parents would literally have no idea that jen was in there like plotting the end of their lives okay so there's that around 9 30 her mother apparently would go out for like line dancing that kind of thing so her mom comes back home now later on that evening like and kind of around the same time but that evening in general Jen jennifer would claim at a certain point she hears her mother calling to her father in English. And Jennifer will say like, this isn't really normal because they don't, really, her mother doesn't really speak that language of the house. And so it put the red flags up for Jennifer, she'll say like, something was not right with that. So Jennifer will say like, basically at the same time, she hears these unfamiliar voices. So essentially she's like, look, I need to get out the phone. She tells this person, I gotta go. And she goes out to see what is going on. Okay, now, this will be the beginning of many different versions of what went down, right? According to who you talk to, and honestly, when you're talking to Jen or listening to her, depending on where what story she's kind of serving at that point. Uh, so, we're going to be entering into a phase in the video where we're going to be looking at some of the footage and things of that nature. Now, Jen will say when she comes out of the room, a man greets her. He will end up tying her up to the banister and is essentially like, do, you know, do, a, do what you're being told to do is this the gentleman is this the guy who tied you up yes okay i want you to my, he, he was the one that tied my wrist together he wasn't the one that tied me to the banister okay so where did he get the shoelaces or whatever the laces were or whatever it was that tied you up i'm not sure it might have been from my mother's room or the study room or because my mom has a sewing table next to her bed, bed so when you open the door where is this guy he was just stepping out of my brother's, well, what formula would be my brother's room. So he's already on the upstairs. Yeah. Do you know where the other guys involved in this are? I know one stayed with my parents downstairs. So one thing to notice about this particular clip, now this is soon after like this whole thing went down. There's a series of interviews that take place with her, right? And so this is one of the first. Now she's wearing, you know, frumpy kind of sweater, hair's a mess, whatever, all this drama's going on. They don't really know exactly what happened. So there's that there's you know this energy levels going on of thinking she's a victim in this right so jim will say there's also you know a couple other men they're robbing the home this type of situation and she'll say that they keep asking for money and that she gives them two grand from her room she had allegedly been saving this up for an iphone now this amount of money will change later on it will be one of the things in the interviews that the cops are like uh yeah 
this is getting completely sus, but many little parts to her story will do this, right? Because remember, when you're lying through your teeth about numerous things, you can't keep up with it, right? Uh, and when you try and pull something like this off, it's just like, oh, girl, this is way beyond the scope. E even a mastermind criminal would have a hard time keeping up with a story like this, right? So there's that. Okay, let's continue. So, let me just find my notes again here. Now, she will say that two of the men, eventually they take her parents downstairs and they have them put blankets over their heads. And Jim would testify that she'll hear pops and that she had a hidden phone in her back pocket and that once the intruders were gone, she would use that to call 911. Now, her father, Han, would describe a horrifying, horrifying scene that evening right he would describe being awakened by the intruders and led downstairs where he and his wife would plead for them to not hurt jennifer he would describe the blankets being handed to him and his wife with instructions to put them over their heads and he would say how of course they didn't want to of course they were afraid to comply but eventually they would he would describe the assailants opening fire on them and that when he came to first of all he realized like number one i'm still alive right um, luckily for him, the blankets obstructed, obviously, the view of their heads, and he was able to live. Now, he didn't get by without injury. Uh, his wife, unfortunately, Bick, she did not make it. They would take her life. And when he came to, he realized this, right? Now, the assailants at that point were gone. So he comes to and he realizes, you know, oh my God, I'm alive. She hasn't made it. And he runs from the house screaming for help. But one thing is very interesting. He does not go back to try and help his daughter. Now, later, Han would describe something very odd, something that was, you know, something people don't really want to hear. Not that people don't want to hear, but like when investigators start listening to this and whatnot, it's something that you're just like, what? And he would describe seeing his daughter talking to one of these robbers or whatever, but not in any kind of way that was like in a fearful way, but like in a familiar way, like they knew each other kind of a way. So, yeah. And one thing that he didn't know at this time is that Jennifer had left their door unlocked for those very men to be able to gain access into their home. Now, later at the hospital, he would have to be flown to another, like, better equipped hospital where he would be put in induced coma to be able to actually survive this horrifying evening. And sadly for him, that was like the beginning of the nightmare for him, right? Because what he would survive and what he would wake up into and his new reality and the truths that would come out, it's, I, I can't imagine living through that, especially with the loss of his wife. And really, honestly, the loss of half of his family then, right? Because, I mean, this is just terrible. The things that would he would find out. The level of betrayal. And so that's where you have to start peeling the layers back to say, how do you arrive here? How does this happen? And so that's what we're going to do now. Let's start looking at other aspects of this case to answer those questions. How did they all arrive to this spot in life. So Jennifer and Felix's parents, uh, Big and Han, they were Vietnamese immigrants and they would be considered pretty strict parents, right? Very strict. And in fact, they're what would be considered by many to be known as tiger parents. And what I wanna do is just take a moment to look at that and set the stage because that really ends up being an intricate part of this story. So Amy Chua in 2011 coined the term tiger parenting um, and she did a book about this the book was called Battle Hem of the Tiger Mom. Now, in her book, she is a Yale, first of all, she's a Yale Law School professor, and she claims that her strict and openly controlling method of parenting basically led both of her daughters to have like extremely successful lives. Now, according to her definition of what a tiger parent is, and we're going to go by that, they are mothers of Chinese or other ethnic origin who are highly controlling and authoritarian. The style of parenting is seen as harsh, demanding, and often emotionally unsupportive. Children in this environment are sent the message that high levels of success, especially academic, come at any cost, often, which often means no free time, play dates, sleepovers, or kid activities. So there's that. Now, from the, what I read in the book and whatnot, and just, you know, newspaper clippings, things like that, researching Jennifer, I mean, it definitely sounds like she fit the bill. Another thing that I think is interesting, because I kind of went on like a Reddit dive on this, kind of seeing what different people were saying, and many people who, say, have lived through the culture of what they would say, 
I had tiger parents, that kind of a thing. That a lot of people were like, her parents weren't that bad. You know what I'm saying? They were like, this is, it could be worse, right? I mean, many people could say that. I'm not trying to dilute that or whatever, right? It's just kind of the things that I saw. Um, so a lot of it just kind of depends on somebody's background, right? Um, now, to me, the things that I read about Jennifer, I'm like, whoa, like her parents were like super strict, right? But, you know, my parents weren't that way. So there's that. Um, so again, I thought it was interesting obviously regardless of how strict one wants to say they are it didn't work for Jennifer okay and we're gonna talk about why uh, because I do think that there were some catastrophic events in her life that changed her perspective on things that snapped her kind of out of that ability to achieve these things that she felt her parents were and that her parents did want her to achieve right so let's continue talking about the parents so her parents came over here you know they busted their butts they worked in an auto parts manufacturer and they what they really wanted was like what so many parents want right they wanted a better life for their children okay they didn't want felix and jennifer to have to do the same things that they did they wanted better opportunities for them better jobs that kind of a thing so you know there's nothing really abnormal there right but they probably knew a life of struggle and hardship that jennifer and felix did not know just you know because of just because of circumstance so i can completely understand her parents wanting that life for both of them now obviously a lot of pressures were put on them and one thing i thought that was interesting is well number two we've established jennifer is the older sibling so there's kind of almost like a not a double standard but a double standard but like different pressures put on her because she was older and even felix will talk about this a lot of yeah there was like a different expectation right now another thing that was interesting is you know jennifer allegedly from what i could tell really really loved her little brother and kind of of came off like a second mother to him um but he would even say like on the stand and things of that that she was pushed in a way that he wasn't now another thing interesting that i read in this book it's like once the horrors had occurred that whole thing felix would give a couple of examples of things that would take place just to kind of describe the vibe right and i'm going to kind of refer to my notes here and this was mostly in regards to his father's anger and he cited one example where he said that they were on a family bike ride and like felix fell off and he actually had broken his arm his dad got like super pissed right like he was just like not uh, happy about this and you know felix had to push the bike back and it was a scene and then there's another time where he cut his finger and his dad got really mad at him and yelled at him so there was like that kind of a thing it just sounded very strict very you know oh my god you messed up we're so focused on that we're not looking at the fact that you broke your arm or whatever um now jen was expected to strive for the best and from what i can tell looking into the tiger parenting thing this seems to play along with this so you know she was had to be the best in anything she did right she was compared to others compared to her cousins um one thing also that came up that she would say, and I mean, this is allegedly because I don't believe a lot of stuff that comes from Jen's mouth, but she did say that her parents didn't really get along that well. And once Felix was gone, she had to play a mediator. She had a very strict curfew, things of this nature. So she wasn't viewed in like youth figure skating. So for example, she was, en she was enrolled in that, but the goal was the Olympics. You know what I mean? Like that was kind of the difference instead of, hey, here's this thing you're doing, it's the Olympics, that type vibe. Um, she was also enrolled in swimming, did not, these things really weren't by her choice. Now, she did take up piano, and she, I think she did seem to really enjoy that. Uh, it seemed to be really like therapy for her. She would go to school, she would practice, she would come home, she would do homework past midnight, get up, do it all again. Just highly stressful, very little time for self, that kind of thing. She did begin to self-harm at one point. So she lived in this very just pressurized life of a lot of expectation and a lot of pressure put on herself to perform and to succeed. Um, now, here is one of the pivotal points in her life that took place that kind of, in my opinion at least, changed her outlook on her ability of things to be able to accomplish them, but also her desire and her drive. 
So Jennifer would attend a Catholic school and she considered herself like the school pet, not the class pet, the school damn pet, okay. Like she was like staying after helping in the admin, you know, office, she would volunteer for this, duties for this, I mean, help grade paper, you name it. If there was a butt to be kissed, she was like, here I am, how they need to be kissed. I mean, she was all up in it, right? And so this is what she was doing, and, and, you know, and that's just what she did. So she was going along doing all this. Now she was getting good grades, awards, you know, all this type of stuff. Well, she's expecting to like sweep, you know, when she was getting ready to graduate, whatever you call it in that grade. I mean, she was like expecting to be like, have the damn school named after her, you know, just shy of, right? So she really didn't get any awards with the valedictorian or anything like that. And so this was a hundred percent like a crushing blow to this girl. I mean, because in her mind, she was like, I literally did everything. I mean, she's just like, I, what, what, what more could you do? Like, I, I've done it all. I've like, what? And it was a crushing blow to her, like for the drive to keep going, right? And I really feel like from what I read of her, this is where she gave up, if you will. This is one of the places where it was like, why bother? And she would say in some places where she was like, well, why try? If I put all this energy and effort in and I didn't get anything, then why keep going? Now, one thing I thought was interesting that she didn't really seem to get is that it was like, well, you have all that, but she wasn't like this well-rounded person at that time. It was almost like she put all of her eggs in this one basket, but she forgot to almost have like a, I don't want to say a personality, but almost like there was this other personal aspect to all that missing. It was almost like there was nothing beneath the surface of that. Like she was going through and checking these boxes off and they were all like, you know, the business side of it. But it was like, well, there also has to be a pulse to it. And she was not clicking those things off, if that makes sense. So that's just my little take on it. So there's that. So let's talk about the relationship with her parents, right? Because clearly it was complicated. So now as we have talked, pressure was huge to succeed in this household, right? Especially for her, right? She was being compared to classmates, cousins, you name it, the whole nine yards. Now in her parents' eyes, for the longest time, this girl was like a straight A student. This girl was, you know, getting excellent grades. Um, scholarships, early acceptance to college, graduated from a pharmacology program. You name it, this girl was getting it. I mean, she would have had them thinking she was on her way to get, you know, I, I, blessed by the damn Pope. I mean, it, you name it, it was going on with her, right? Okay, but the only thing is, it was all a lie, okay? Homegirl hadn't even graduated high school. I'm gonna have to give it to this damn girl the gall and the balls on this girl. I'm like, oh, I mean, when I read this and looked at the depth of her lies and what she went through, I, I mean, it's a normal thing, I think, for teenagers and kids and like that, you know, to break a rule, to try and pull a fast one. And there's like varying degrees on that scale, right? Of like, oh, whoa, you know. Um, this is off the Richter scale. Okay, this is when we start getting into Jennifer Pan, Chandler Halderson, Joel Guy Jr., Grant Amato, this level of deception, it is off the the Richter scale and she was right there along with them so after she was like this amazing middle school student all that type stuff yeah you know, she doesn't sweep up the war she doesn't get any of that so it, to me she kind of like lost the wind in her sails right and like her grades start slipping in high school and the bad grades start coming in now remember that a B is a bad grade in this household right that is just like oh my god don't even show your face sweetie. so a D is like get out. I've seen all I needed to see. I'm done. You can go home. Throw the whole child away. Okay. That kind of a thing. Right. So it's bad. Okay. So she starts getting these bad grades. Now here's the thing. So the colleges apparently didn't look at like the grades. Like it didn't matter ninth and 10th grade or whatever. And God, if I'd known that when I was in high school, um, I could have benefited from that. Uh, but they didn't pay attention to that ninth and 10th grade. So she's like, you know what? I've got time. 
I can make this work. I've got time to catch up. And so this is where the beginning of the lies began. And she starts forging report cards to hide average grades, right? And at first it sounded, so I legitimately believe her on this. It, it started off as something to buy herself time. And it was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do this this one time and it's gonna get me to blank, right? But then, oh, that's just so easy. And look at how much easier it was to get the accolades from mom and dad and you know you keep all that drama away by doing this right i mean i get it so it becomes a habit right so then she starts so this is going on right so then she starts getting rejected from like secondary schools things of this nature basically she has to up the ante right so this goes from like forging a little bit of like a i'm trying to just stay a straight a student to you know i'm forging graduations and you know college acceptances and things of that nature um so she gets rejected from secondary schools and she forges documents to say like otherwise she forges documents about scholarships financial documents this is one that gets me that I'm like, how could you pull this off? So when it came to graduation, she told her parents, like, look, I only have one ticket and I'm not going to make y'all choose. So I gave it to a friend. And part of me is just like, how? I mean, that's so bizarre to me. <sighs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just like, would they not question that? Because I, again, every household is different. I would have just thought that my parents would have been like, well, in my household would have been like, well, my mom's going. You know what I'm saying? It would have been no questions asked. Like, I mean, my mom was going to go, right? That part was weird to me. But nonetheless, I mean, she was snowing them over on so many different things. So there was that. Now, Jennifer's parents, they assumed... She's like this A student, right? Because again, this is like years of lies and deceptions. So, I, I mean, there's that. Now, she would continue doing this. She does all this. Now, the school that she got an early acceptance to at one point, it was called Ryerson. But then she would have fail calculus in the final year of high school, wasn't able to graduate, and the university withdrew the offer. And so that is what caused her to be like, you know let's take this to the next level so it's almost like this chain of events happened you can see with her where things just kept getting worse and so like that level of shame for her of oh my god that's gonna bring shame to my parents to like not graduate i mean oh my god right i mean that kind of thing and i'm not i don't want to sound like i'm condoning what she did because i'm not um but i'm also looking at two sides of it because i do think something started off in a certain way and then it got way out of control and she went way off the deep end because the things what she ultimately chose to do is absolutely disgusting and absurd um but where it all started off with, I'm just like, I mean, my God, right? It just kept getting worse and worse for her. So anyway, let's continue. So I'm just referring to my notes here. So now, but she lied about this whole Ryerson thing. She's like, mm -mm, nope, here we go, here we go. And she just had this whole thing. It's just like, I'm going to do two years of science. Then I'm transferring over to U of T's pharmacology program. I mean, and her father, he was like, oh, I love it. You know, and he went out, got her stuff. And I mean, she went all the way to, she was like going out and getting used biology books and all this kind of stuff, supplies and yada, yada, yada. She even went to Fresh Week. I mean, she played the role. She was like going, when her parents were dropping her off, she was going to a library, taking these used books, making fake notes. I mean, the, the amount of work this girl put into looking like, she would, looking like she was going to school, she could have been going. It's like at a certain point, it's just like, girl, just like go, right? But, you know, I guess it was easier just to fake that, I guess. Okay, so enough about my rant about all that because that the level of deception with all that again i can make 10 videos on it y'all it's it's it blows my mind so school wasn't the only thing she was deceptive about though right she was also deceptive about her love life and this would be her ultimate in my opinion downfall because one thing i did notice looking at it is i was like oh this is like the perfect storm for this girl to have 
those feelings about someone and the absolute inability to know how to deal with it or to do anything about it and also this whole thing of i can just make a fake world up it was never going to end well do you have a boyfriend i had a boyfriend but no i don't have one. What, what's your what's your, what was your boyfriend's name daniel daniel what Wong. tell me about your relationship with you and daniel a boy named daniel might just be the most perfect thing that she could have ever imagined happening to her, but he would eventually become her co-defendant in this absolutely bizarre story. It was a really tough one. Um, we went to high school together. He helped me through a really difficult time in high school um, when I have asthma, but it, it wasn't a concern. Uh, it was only a concern when I was younger. Um, but when I went over to Europe, um, a lot of sick people were smoking cigarettes and it acted up over there and he took care of me over there. When did you go to Europe? 2003. Okay, and how long were you there for? Under two weeks, I think. Okay. So this is how their relationship started off, right? I mean, imagine being that age, that grade, this kind of thing, and this dude, it, you know, comes and you know saves you, if you will. So to me, when I read the story, I was just like, oh yeah, this was like this knight in shining armor, this kind of a thing with all of those already like heady feelings when you're that age or whatever so I, I just thought it was interesting that they started off like this now their relationship oh my god i mean it's you know all over the place right um and, and it was sad because i mean to me the relationship also has a lot of like kind of romeo and juliet dynamics to it and obviously it ended on a very tawdry note so this is 2003 when you and danny were started dating no, uh, later on in 2003, we were just friends at that point. Okay. What grade were you in at that point? 11. 11. So how does your relationship with Danny can, uh, develop? Where, where does it go and how long does it last? It lasted about six years. Um, it began in the summer of 2003 before my grade 12 year. Uh, we were just really good friends and I guess it just happened like we just started going out well saying that we were going out but um i didn't really get to see him much let's talk about that why didn't you get the chance to see him much i wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend so let's talk about Jennifer and Daniel. Now, they were in band together, and like you heard her saying, their first time away from home, in this first you know trip in another country, asthma flares up, he, she has this major anxiety attack, Daniel comes to the rescue, he was like this little savior to her, and she loves this attention, she felt loved by it. And honestly, looking at one dynamic of it, I was just like, yeah, you know what? Think of this like kind of stern, cold vibe she described her in her household, and then here's this guy that's like, hey baby, you okay? This was probably like intoxicating to her. And one thing that we'll see later in the video when we start talking about like once they go their separate ways for a while, and like the text messages and some of like the utterly bizarre psycho stuff she did, I was like, oh my god, yeah. She was never going to take a break up well, right? Um, so anyways, so let's keep talking about that. But Daniel and Jen, they were both like really good at music, very ingrained in family life. And he also had a younger brother, so they had this in common. Um, and he also sounds like he was like really in touch with his emotional side. He felt like there was more to life than like all work and play. And, and she liked that. I mean, this is something that she yearned for as well. Um, now, she did have a boyfriend at the time when this whole like little asthma thing happened. Uh, and she would end up leaving that dude so that she could be with Daniel uh, but her and this guy would remain good friends and so there was that but now here's the thing she would keep this relationship secret you know and again just like so many things in her life she became very good at this double life they would only interact in school at school now here's another thing about Daniel Daniel sold marijuana 
And uh, Jennifer would first allege, like in interviews and stuff like that, that she was like, oh, uh, uh, I didn't have nothing to do with that. That's illegal. I was frightened. No, thank you. Okay. And so, but then they would quickly be like, they would learn differently, right? And she's like, okay, so maybe I was delivering some of it. Okay, maybe I was there for some of the deals. Right, so <clears throat> there's that. Um, not that I'm like saying that's bad or anything, but it's just again one of those things where she's just she. If you you would think she could play it off if she was like, no, I'm actually a part time nun on the weekends. She could play it off. I mean, she totally could, right? She's like so soft spoken, so this and that. So you buy it at first, but then like when you start scratching the surface, you're like, wait, you did what? You know, and then when you learn she did this, you're like, what? You did what? I mean, it's insane, right? So anyways, so eventually Daniel will get caught with like a pound of the well, damn marijuana. And he manages to keep this hidden from his parents somehow, right? And so there's that. Now, another time, but nonetheless, I mean, obviously this is not good, right? Okay, so this is like, you know, on his record, all this. So there's another time that he lends a car to a friend and this friend ends up getting busted with Special K in the car. Um, Special K is god what is it what is it really <laughs> this is so sad special k is ketamine so this dude right here he got caught with it and uh i guess you know daniel got in trouble for it it was his car right so there's that so daniel had like these blemishes going right i mean he's like you know doing deals and stuff like that right so eventually she does meet him she'll like she'll she'll get caught in this situation right so she'll end up being like okay look you know, I'm going to introduce you all this kind of stuff. But once they meet, the parents are not approving of him. The parents liked the ex, the one she was with beforehand, right? He was more their speed, like, I don't know, just maybe more academic, more all that kind of stuff. And Daniel wasn't like, I mean, he just wasn't that vibe. So the parents, of course, are, this isn't going to go that way. And so again, the trajectory for this relationship, it just isn't on a good path now as i've talked about before you know she had the secret life and this relationship and the whole dynamics of it were part of that you know when her parents saw that they were like dropping her off for school and stuff like this she had this whole elaborate lie going of like oh i'm staying with so-and-so to study and yada 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 well what she would do is she would take public transit downtown she'd have a book bag she'd go to a library she would be doing research at the library um you know filling her books up with fake notes this kind of stuff she'd be going to visit Daniel at school uh, he was going to York, York York University I believe it was where he's taking some classes uh, she was like doing some day shifts as a server at a couple of places she would teach piano lessons and then she was like working at uh, or uh, what was it she did uh, let's see she taught piano lessons and then later attended bar at Boston Pizza where Daniel worked as a kitchen manager so that's what it was um, <clears throat> and so that's kind of what she was doing and just living this double life one thing that I do find curious about this scenario is to think what does she where did she think this would go how does she think this would end at what point is there an end game? You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, if you're lying to this level about a secret relationship in college and all this, it all has to stop at some point, right? Because, you know, you're going to have to do some progress in life or something, right? Or else people will move on. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what happened for her. So now after seven years of this and like, you know, Daniel's sitting here and it's like, look, the pants don't like me. This is not going to worry. He was like, look, I am done. Okay. And so this begins this weird part where he tries to like, I don't even say ostracize, but ostracize her out of his life, right? By being like, shunning but not shunning but he also still had this thing of like almost like keeping her on the back burner to a degree right there is still like this something between them to some degree and he had this he would eventually get another girlfriend okay and to me it was just i didn't really like the way he handled that myself right now here's the other thing he she was super clingy okay You've heard enough about the scenario. You can only imagine what it was like when she went through a damn breakup. I mean, bless her damn heart. My God. Okay. It was not cute. Okay. It was not cute. So they break up. Now, here's the thing. She would like 
kind of at some point him and her they're kind of hooking up on the side she's sending him like you know kind of like saucy pictures doing this kind of stuff then all of a sudden this whole thing starts up at one point and this will go like all the way up until the end right where she is saying something to the effect of like creating this whole scenario of pretending that she's getting threatened because of him and he will kind of come to her rescue. She learns this and she'll send these text messages and be like, almost like she's created this reoccurring theme of him having to come save her and like they get into this pattern of this. But eventually he'll learn, you know, like this person, this anonymous person that sends him these messages will send him stuff and the only way that the person could have known what they're saying is if they were with him and Jenna this time, right? And so he'll start to then see, well, wait a second, I, you know, he's not dating Jim, but like if they happen to hang out, the only time that these messages don't happen is when they're not around each other. You see, or when they're when they're around each other. You see what I'm saying? So he can put two and two to eventually is what I'm saying. It's very obvious and it's super creepy and honestly it's pathetic. But, you know, that's my opinion. Now, once they get all into this whole thing of, you know, the the crimes that took place, the, the money exchange and doing this to take the parents out, this, that, and the other, and yada, 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 text evidence will show that, first of all, Daniel made it clear that he wasn't going to be with Jen at one point. She asked him to call off the situation that was going to go on. She thought that the, taking the parents out would allow them to be together. To me, the text messages between them, it was like, it would be him saying, like, well, let's talk after blank. And it was almost like he was kind of leading that her on a little bit in that way, too. So i don't think he's completely innocent in that i do definitely think that there was like this level of him leading her down this path of very passive aggressively that kind of thing of like you know there there was just that i don't think she's uh, completely all to blame in that little scenario there so and definitely with the whole money thing and all that we'll get into some of the reasonings she describes for all this happening because none of them make sense and i personally think most of them are all lies overall as well before we get into all that the text messages show that jen was completely desperate and thirsty for any attention that daniel would give her any attention even if it was negative doesn't matter what it was. It doesn't matter if it was related to talking about another woman he was seeing or her pretending that she was being stalked by someone that wanted to get revenge on her because of something that he did. It, it just, it doesn't matter. Even if it was them arguing and y'all, the, te the text are out. If I can find one, I'll put it up here because the way the court thing was done. And again, this is Canada. It's just different than here. I had a hard time finding any of them, but I mean, they're, they're they're cringy okay um like embarrassingly so so but they also just show that level of desperation where you're like wow this person is really 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 that hungry for anything that they can get out of this guy okay so now that we are kind of back on that like the chain of events and all that kind of stuff right Let's kind of start swinging back over there. Let's start looking at key players. Let's start looking back at what took event or like what took event at what took place after the fact on that horrifying evening. So now all this goes down. So remember, just like any normal crime thing, like, you know, Jen can't go back to the house, right? You know, this huge crime took place at her house. So she's staying with family members, some cousins or whatever. And they start, the family starts getting very weird towards her, right? Now, remember, the father did not die. So he comes, you know, he starts, he's back. He, he gets out of coma, the induced coma. And he starts telling the people the whole thing about, you know, Jim was taught. I saw these dudes talking to John. You know what I mean? Like, there's something up with that, right? And the, the family will start citing odd behavior as well. You know, and they'll be like, you know what? The uncle will say, I saw Jen at a coffee shop talking to a dude that matches the uh, description of one of the assailants, like, before this happened. And so all these pieces of the puzzle start coming together. Now, even once the father is coming too, he'll say he doesn't want to see his own daughter. I mean, this is major, right? And she'll actually sneak in at one point to see him and he'll straight up ask her and be like, you know, was it Danny? 
obviously not good either, right? Now also, she will then have the balls to ask her father for $1,200 for college tuition. We know damn well she's not going to college, right? So the police then, will, they'll end up making her a suspect during this whole time, right? Um, the police will go to the funeral, they'll do all this type of stuff, and they'll say that she would be there fake crying, trying to make sure that they were like looking at her, almost like this, like, yeah, like making sure that they're watching her pretend to cry or whatever. So all of this is like adding up and it's not looking good. Um, and even her longtime piano instructor will know that they're like, yeah, like those are crocodile tears at the funeral. Something's not adding up. So then Daniel Wong will be brought in for questioning and this doesn't favor anybody very well. So the police will end up getting this anonymous tip that leads them down this path of discovery and shock. So this tipster will tell them, this guy, Daniel Wong, Daniel, the Daniel, the ex-boyfriend, the on again, off again boyfriend, that Daniel is Jen's boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, whatever you want to call him. Uh, but you know that he's a drug dealer and she's like his delivery person. And so when police start looking into Daniel, I mean, as we talked about before with these charges, all this stuff, you know, this starts adding up, right? And so this is when he's brought in to be questioned. And he starts confirming a lot of this information and then telling him a lot of the, telling them a lot of this stuff that would add up to motive, basically, right? So he starts telling them, you know, yeah, look, we're exes. Uh, you know, we hooked up at the beginning of high school, you know, but we've been separated for like two years. We dated behind, you know, the parents' backs. Um, Jen was, you know, busy with school and practices and the parents made it impossible for us to date. And he goes on to tell detectives about this completely fabricated life that she lived by. And of course, this is going to be a shock to anybody that hears this, right? But to the levels of this, obviously, the police are like, oh, what? I mean, this is huge for them. Now, Daniel would tell them about how, you know, all this stuff going on behind their backs and all that type of stuff and how it resulted in this, basically this ultimatum from the parents to her of, you know what, it's him or your family and how ultimately she did choose her family and she would tell them when confronted with this like yes it, you know i chose what i chose type thing but that basically when that took place a lot of stuff changed for jen and you know they she was basically on lockdown at the house right i mean she had to quit all these jobs she had they took all her phones her laptops everything i mean it was like she went into this really just this lockdown mode and i do think that for myself reading this that was a zone for her where she started to I don't know if you want to call it breakdown mentally even more, but that was another pivotal point, if you will, right? Now, Daniel would also describe these phone calls like I was talking about earlier. And he was like, you know, I started getting these really creepy phone calls. And he was like, I would answer and it would go silent. And he's like, but if I didn't answer, he's like, I would get these phone calls like a hundred times a night. And he's like, sometimes I'll get text messages that would say like, bang, bang, and like weird cryptic stuff like that. And I mean, it was like obsessive, right? and he's like Jennifer started getting these things too and so he's telling the cops about all of this information and you know that the cops were like uh, yeah this this is not good this is bad we need to talk to Jennifer so let's talk about some of the crime scene weirdness that was going on too with this because there were some things that the cops were like um yeah let's take that doesn't make sense for 200 place so one of these things is they were like look this something that usually happens like this is not random right like this is usually something that's like people are after something or somebody's involved in some kind of organized crime or something like that but that just wasn't the case here with this family, right? I mean, they just weren't involved in anything of this nature. Now, detectives would also say at the scene that they kept finding cash everywhere. Like Jen had cash in her purse or wallet or whatever she had, money in her mom's purse, her father's. And so they're like, well, as much, as much focus on finding money that Jen's saying was going on, why is there money everywhere, right? Like, this is odd, right? Then second, or not secondly, thirdly at this point, um, there's no forced entry of the house, right? They're, they're, okay, this is weird. And then, huge, the fact that the father is saying, it looked like my daughter was like kind of chilling and talking to one of these dudes, right? So all this stuff starts adding up, and it's, again, it's just, it's not looking good, and it's creating this 
lens that has switched over from, okay, this is some horrifying, you know, random tragedy to we need to be looking a little bit deeper into this. Now, in doing so, obviously, they're going to want to talk to Jen, right, regardless of what they think and what they find out along the way. And so there's a few different interviews with Jen that take place, right? Obviously, they're going to be talking to her right after the fact because this just happened. And that's when it's fresh. They want to get information. They'll bring her back in again and then again. Now, as each of the interviews goes on, one thing that is interesting is, number one, she goes from just leaving the scene to, you know, it's a little bit further deep into it. Maybe she's had time to let her conscience get to her a little bit. I don't know. Um... But they have had time to get more information that definitely lets them know, look, she, this, the, this is not adding up, right? So what I want to do is just look at some of the clips from her interrogation, from her interrogation, from her interviews. Go over those and just talk about them and make some commentary. So on her first one, she acts overall nervous. And again, looking at what just happened, this is understandable, right? I mean, allegedly you have just survived this horrifying home invasion. So this is completely normal. But one thing that's also interesting because this comes back to bite her in the butt, right? Is they make it crystal clear, like, you know, no, there can be no line, no pointing the finger at anybody. Like, you know, we need to know what happened. You can't point the finger at someone else. You can't tell us to go off in a different direction. You just got to tell us the truth. Well, I know. Exactly, exactly. And do you have any questions with respect to what I've just told you? It's just like sitting sometimes like parts come back that I didn't remember when I spoke No one is, it. and that's the process. This is going to be a long process. This is an initial statement from you. We may, you know, as you remember other things, you may be asked, you may want to come in and tell us things, okay? No one is going to tell you how to give us a, per give a perfect statement. You just do what the best you can. Given the, given what you're dealing with, okay? Any other questions? So during this initial interview, as you can see, you know, she looks a little bit disheveled here. Another thing that I think is interesting is she's kind of, the first things out of her mouth is like, oh, the things that I can remember. You know what I mean? So she's kind of setting this up. But again, to me, and obviously I'll know I'm not like a detective or anything. I mean, to me, this wouldn't strike me as too odd in the beginning because I could see this being a completely normal thing of, look, we need to know this. We need this information. And especially if it just happened, because you know how like when something traumatic or adrenaline based has happened and it's kind of blurry that would be totally normal to me right so this part would not strike me as odd or anything like that in the least at the very beginning but let's let's keep going because the oddness definitely does come so now you hear this commotion downstairs you said you heard two pops and you heard who scream your mom and what was she screaming do you remember? I it out. It yeah. was kind of like a cry, cry yell, so it was just... Okay. It, are, are they still talking? Do you hear them talking? I was focused on my mom. And no, I understand. I'm only going to ask questions that I can try and tweak your memory for, okay? So, you hear the two pop noise, you hear your mom screaming, or crying, or screaming, or yelling, and then you hear some more. So one thing that strikes me with her testimony, or not testimony in this, but her answers, her questions, is there is just this kind of like flat, emotionless response to this. There's not a lot of stuff going on here. And again, I don't know how I'd react in this scenario. So, I mean, I can't say. I think everybody's different. And again, since it's the first time, meaning this, you know, has, has <clears throat> this has seemingly just happened, I give it a little bit more room there, right? But nonetheless, there just does seem to be this just extra benevolence towards it that I just kind of find disarming. My mom kept trying to get up and they kept telling her to sit down. And so I didn't want her to get hurt. So I told her mom to sit down. They were trying to find her wallet, but she, her English sinker, so she kept saying first. They kept pushing her down onto the chair. Okay. Take your time. Take your time. Now here's a little bit more of like the real emotion that you would expect to see, right? Now from what some things that I read and whatnot, police that were watching this through the mirrors and whatnot said that the, even though like they gave her tissues and stuff, there was no actual real tears when she would start to cry or whatever. And so 
of course, watching it through these grainy footages that we do or whatever, it looks, you know, authentic and whatnot. Another thing that I think of is in the context of what we know now and looking at her talking about this, number one, you know, this probably isn't even true the way this went down, right? That she's describing this and hoping to help her mother. I mean, it sounds like she was just walking around the house, like hanging out with these people, right? Probably like trying to figure out what to do or whatever. Um, but to be able to sit there and listen to your parents screaming and crying for help and especially screaming and crying not to have you hurt, right? That your parents being like, do whatever to us. Uh, you know, don't hurt her, right? And you kind of know it. You facilitated it. It sends shivers down my spine. It, it just, I don't, I'm going to save some of my thoughts towards the end so we don't get too far off target. Y'all know how I do here at the sofa. So, anyways, let's keep watching the next clip. They wouldn't let me come with them. And after they said, the last thing I heard them say was, You lied. You lied to us. You lied to us. And then I heard two pops. My mom screamed. I yelled out for her. And a couple more pops. I heard my dad go up the stairs, and at that point, I had my phone in my po in my on me, behind me, that I had hidden there that they didn't know about. So when I, when I, when they, when I thought that they had heard them all leave and my dad ran up the stairs, I whipped up the phone and I called 911. But I, I still hadn't heard anything from my mom and all I could hear was my dad running on the street, just moaning and making sounds. So this is the part with this clip right here. So all this is going down. The dad's out running. He doesn't come back for her, right? That's red flag central, right? And, and of course, at this time, they don't know why really, right? But we all know now at this point because, well, he saw her hanging out with the perpetrators, right? So it's like he doesn't want to go back in there. He doesn't know who to trust, right? This is completely understandable. So, you know, very red flaggy, very odd or whatever. Now, let's also visit, revisit and visit another strange aspect of this. It's like all this tragic stuff has happened. It goes down. The father knows, you know, something's not right in the house. His daughter's in there. No signs of wanting to stick around and help her. All that type of stuff. So let's look into the aspect of you know, how does she get untied? The operator had begged her not to leave me alone and that my dad was outside. I, I was yelling at him, but he wouldn't come in. I don't know if he didn't hear me, he didn't come in. I think he went to look for help. And I didn't get to see my dad at all until before I left the hospital just now. How did you get free? The cop came and he snipped the two the two strings off for me. I was I was asking them for so long and, <clears throat> and they said they couldn't untie me until they knew how to properly untie the string. Okay. So she clarifies even more here. Now again, red flags have to be going off of this detective, right? Have to be. You know, I was yelling for my dad, but I guess he didn't hear me or this and that. This is very weird, right? I mean, completely weird. So, and of course, again, now that we know what happened, it's it makes it even, it just backs up the story, right? So, even odder to me is listening to it is, I guess, how'd you get untied? Oh, the cops came, but, you know, they went to untie me. They said we had to figure out how to untie it. And I'm like, well, what kind of, why couldn't they just clip it? You know, all these questions or whatever. So, but again, you know, we weren't there to see the thing whatever I, you know there's a little bit of leeway there what i'm trying to get at okay so let's listen to her second day right when this comes back up and let's hear what she has to say it just looked like a black shoelace i okay any any interaction any communication going on between you and number one and, and number two while this is being while you're being bound my mother's calling for me Okay. And they keep saying that to shut up. Who's saying that to who? Number three is downstairs and she's telling her to shut up. She's telling her to shut up. What's your dad doing? I can't hear my father. Okay. 
<clears throat> you're now bound to this to the to the railing. Can you show me? Can you stand up and turn around and tell me? Just show on the camera how your hands are bound and how you are against the railing. You don't have to sit down. I just need to see how you were. Okay, so first of all, let's pause right here. You know right here she was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know she had to be just, well, messing her pants. I mean, because she's she has to be just freaking out because it's like, oh my God, I have to actually prove this now. This is not a cute look for her, okay? So let's roll the tape. Just tell you. The only reason that I'm trying to, uh, I need to do this is that I'm also going to ask you is that it, so take this back to, from, take it out of a traumatizing event, which it is, and put, put yourself into a more clinical position, because I want to see how you could physically get your phone out of your waistband. We're obviously going to need to know that. It's very important. So traumatize a wide way. Now put yourself into a, just a state of, I need to man mechanically show how I can get access to my phone. Okay, because that's obviously very relevant. I, we know you made the phone call, but questions are going to obviously raise is that if my hands are bound and I'm against the railing, how do I talk to a 911 operator? Okay, so clinically, this is now a clinical demonstration. I mean, she is searching the bottom of that damn cup for something. She's like. I don't know how I'm going to get past this one, right? I mean, she, and when he was like, this is going to be clinical, this is going to be this, she's like, <sighs> not good. And I mean, at this point, they know she's lying, right? They know something is completely up with her story. So, again, I'll give it to her. I mean, the girl's got some balls, right? I mean, she's she is going head to head with them, right? She is going to come up with some BS to serve them, and let's see what she serves. Okay. Now, and the, are you restrained from movement? How far can you move your hands from the banister? They tied my upper arm. Yes. Around the banister. Yes. But my hands were bound together. I mean, my God. She can think on a damn dime, right? I'm just like, are you kidding me? It's pretty interesting how, and maybe they really did do this, like to kind of go along with the whole scenario or whatever and tie her up like that and make it so easy for her to be able to do that. Because here's my thing too, and again, I don't know anything like, you know, about tying knots and all this kind of stuff, but if you were going to tie someone to a banister, I mean, first of all, why even do that, right? Like, the whole thing is this. None of it even makes sense, right? You don't break into somebody's house and do all this and take someone out, leave the daughter, and all. I mean, none of it makes sense. But let's just say if this is even going to be a scenario. Number one, why would you tie them to the banister? Number two, why even do that and risk that to be like, oh, I was tied around here up here, but my arms were free. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. And the way she's able to sit here and just, you know, oh, I did this with the phone. Oh, I dialed nine one one. Oh, I could do this, and I'm just like. Again, it's just, it's so flimsy, but she's just going through these little motions right here. Maybe she did rehearse this, you know? I mean, again, she's a master at deception. Look at what she's been doing her whole life. Put your sweater back on. Just put your sweater on. Yeah, yeah. Now, she acts so traumatized over having to do that. I mean, I can't roll my damn eyes hard enough, right? It's just absurd how she just tries to play that up and, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, what a monster, right? I mean, I'm just like, I just can't get over it. I'm just like, God, I mean, the level of just depravity with it, right? So none of that goes well, right? I mean, you know, the cops are walking her through this, but again, I, I, I'm very fascinated and intrigued uh and almost like you know hey tip my hat to the way she's able to go toe to toe right and just kind of keep up with this level of bs that she's serving to them so let's listen to what she has to say on day two where she's a little bit more poised a little bit more put together um a little more you know formulated with her thoughts and ideas about what exactly went down i heard my dad calling out the door and he's like yelling on the street Okay. And I'm calling for him, but the dispatch lady, I'm trying to... So when the officers arrive, how do you get untied? <sighs> I'm 
you remember? At first, they were all outside, and I, I was screaming for them. Yeah. And finally, someone heard me, and they came up the stairs. First, they had to check all the rooms first, but I just wanted them to get me out. Yeah. I didn't want to be sitting there anymore. So they, how did they get you free? They grabbed a pair of scissors from my room. But the officer said to wait a few minutes because he didn't know how to, how to do it, the procedure. But I just wanted to get out. Okay, so notice how in this one, where, again, she keeps her head down, she's weepy, she's very reluctant about saying exactly what went down. Uh, she does keep up with the story about, oh, they got some scissors, you know, from my room. But little details change throughout the whole scenario. You know, she'll say, oh, they got some scissors from here. I think before she was trying to say that they got the string or something from her mom's sewing thing or something like that. But regardless, you know, now, oh, they wanted to keep it because they weren't sure how to do this. Obviously, I just, I don't believe anything she's saying here, and I think she's kind of buying herself time, and I think she's reluctant because she's lying about something, right? Uh, about the whole thing, obviously. Um, and, and I think at this point, too, the cops know that. And I don't, uh, one thing that perplexes me and that I'm curious about with these is, does she know that they know yet? Or is, you know, is she getting an idea that they know? Because again, if you look back at how much she lied to her parents about so many different things, she would have to also really be in tune with, do my parents know? Are they buying this? That kind of a thing. So almost being in tune with that with people. So I would almost think surely she can't be this stupid. She has to know at this point, like the things they're walking me through and asking me over and over, they have to be on to me in some way, right? But regardless if she knows what's going on, if they think, well, whatever. You know, none of this is really going her way, right? And then they'll drag Mr. Loverboy's name into it. And that's when you know things are going really bad. When he was in the air the other day. Now, so stepping back from that is, I had asked you is prior to the incident, when's the last time you spoke to Daniel? What I should have said to you is, when is the last time from today for back that you spoke to Daniel? When is the last time you met with him and spoke with him? I saw him here yesterday when I was leaving. Did you talk to him? Just briefly. You didn't see him or talk to him any other times other than right here in the police station? And if I told you that Daniel says that you spoke to him, you did have a conversation with him somewhere else? He would be lying? Girl don't know what to say. Okay, because I, I, this is what I'm thinking. In her mind, her world has to be crashing down. Because the reality of it is, is her and Daniel had this secret phones, or she had a secret phone, I should say, that she was going back and forth with all these conversations with him, right? And so there's this dynamic going on there that she, I guess, maybe didn't put two and two together or didn't think that they knew about this. It kind of surprises me, but whatever. So also the fact that this information is coming forward too that she's probably realizing, you know, he's told, has Daniel really said this, right? And so it has to be like a guttural punch to her to be like, oh my God, because if they know that, then they know a whole bunch of other stuff that they shouldn't know, meaning the police. Now, eventually the cops will just cut to the damn chase. So you're telling me that you you had no involvement in what happened meaning not saying how the outcome came but you you had no involvement in in any type of illegal activity that would have drawn you or the attention of you to have bad people come to your house looking for large sums of money you're not involved in this any which way because the question obviously stands jennifer is you're upstairs and they're downstairs right so it's a natural concern when, why would they leave you alone? Why would they not do the same to you? And a damn good question it is, officer. So 
they know this, right? And it, again, it's funny how she sits here and starts to cry during this part because it's so obvious. I mean, it is true. Why wouldn't they harm you? Why wouldn't they have done this? Why is there money still here? I mean, the whole nine yards, none of this adds up, right? And they have all this intel behind there. So it's interesting too, it's just how she has so easily lied. But again, it shouldn't really be that interesting to me because this girl has done this for so long. Now, let's watch a clip of her, how she begins to react when left alone. So she begins to have her little meltdown, right? She's not doing well. She's nervous. She's upset. You know, probably getting pretty scared that her world is crumbling down. Remember how we talked about earlier, her family knows something's up, right? Even her family is not trusting her. So her world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, by the time she makes it to her third round of interviews, whatever you want to call it, this is where the confession will finally be. And I mean pulled out of the girl oh my god i mean it was excruciating if any of us had sat in there we would have confessed whatever they were asking us i mean my god but let's just take a look at a couple of clips from that with me again let's get through this you're sorry out now are you not are you sorry for what happened Pardon? You wish you could take it back? Jen? Okay, that's good to hear. That's so positive. You wish it didn't happen, right? That night you wish you'd never got this plan in motion, right? Right? You wish you never told anybody to do this, right? Now, it's interesting his technique here. You wish you never told anybody to do this, right? I, I mean, just try pulling this out of her. I imagine, I mean, first of all, nobody wants to confess and get in trouble, right? She knows what she did was wrong, right? On top of that, the level of shame that is probably wrapped around in this with her and the dynamic of, you know, just where this whole thing came from and and wound up, right? I mean, because this is one of those things where it literally just kind of comes back down to this, you know, pressure she was living under, her inability to handle that, this false world that she created, all of these lies, this love affair she had with Daniel that was quite bizarre towards the end of... You know, he has this other girl, just, you know, maybe things can work out without the parents. I mean, all that, right? It's just all very bizarre. And that her answer, like some of these other people we see, is, well, I'll just, you know, wipe my parents out. But to involve all the people that they did. In a minute, we're going to talk about the co-defendants because there's other people besides her and Daniel that got wrapped up into this. And I shouldn't say wrapped up into it, that willingly joined in on this to make money off of it or whatever. Um... So yeah, so let's look at when it all comes crashing down for Jennifer. Finally, the moment of truth, and it's time to slap some cuffs on her. Okay, so at this point, you wish to speak to duty counsel then? Sure. Okay, so what I'm going to have to get you to do is actually empty all your pockets on the table here. Okay? Uh, can you? Um, I have to tell people who are expecting me to... I mean... Who's that? my uncle okay we'll speak to them uh can you stand up and just empty your pockets just put it on the table here okay okay anything else just pull out those pockets okay nothing else mm -hmm. okay so just have a seat for a minute i'm just going to check your coat okay okay so just sit down So can you imagine the uncle when they got the phone call about that? Like, yes, yeah, she finally confessed. Can you imagine the father when he got the phone call of, 
yep, we've confirmed what, what you thought, you know, your daughter did this. Oh, my God. I mean, can you just imagine? Yeah, because a lot of these cases we've seen where the children were successful in taking both parents out, obviously in that moment, the parent realized it, right? For this scenario, number one, it sounded like there was this confusion because it wasn't the actual child t taking them out, right? She was involved, but it was just like, does she know these people? What's going on and all this chaos? And so it's almost like an after the fact of confirmed. Now, obviously the dad knew enough not to go back in that damn house when his daughter was calling for him. So that speaks of volumes, right? But nonetheless, just to have it confirmed, like, yes, yeah, she confessed to it. I mean, you've, I mean, where do you go from there, right? I mean, if she's alleging that she's coming from parents who would disown her over a bad grade, this ain't gonna fare well. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the co-defendants and some of the other people who were involved in this crime. We're also going to kind of intersect this with some of her testimony on the stand and talk about some earlier circumstances that either took place or didn't take place. It depends on who you believe, right? And I'm just going to be referring to my notes here on the computer for this. So one person's name was Eric Sean Cardi, aka Sniper. Uh, another person's name was David, and then obviously Daniel Wong, who we talked about uh, already in great length. Now another person who was not taken in at this time, or he was taken in, but he just, he ended up going separately in a different trial. Uh, his name was Limford Crawford. Now the Crown would say that this would be who would be referred to as homeboy. Now one thing that would take place on the stand is that Jennifer would talk about an earlier plan that had hatched but not hatched. And this would involve when she started talking to a friend named Andrew. She reconnected with this person. Uh, and according to Jennifer, you know, they're hanging out, they're talking. He kind of had a similar situation with a father. And through hook or crook or whatever, and listening to him talk about, you know, boasting about robbing people and that kind of thing, they hatched this plan where he was going to take her father out, right? And so he involves another person in this scenario. And Jennifer, and again, this is according to her. So he's involving another kid. His name's Ricardo. And Jennifer is going to pay them $1,500. Now, she allegedly earned this money from piano lessons, this kind of stuff, right? So Jennifer will allege on the stand, she'll be like, well, look, I paid him this money. And then he stopped making phone calls, stopped calling, or not making phone calls, stopped answering her phone calls, that kind of a thing. And basically she finally was like, well, I guess I've been ripped off. And so, you know, I guess it was like, well, that plot's by the wayside, right? Now, in contrast to what she is saying, and Duncan will say, no, that's not how that went. And then in early July, he gets a phone call from her uh, requesting that he come and take her parents out. And that basically he was looking at it almost like she was... Uh, like profiling him or you know almost like kind of like racially profiling him almost like well you would do this because you know what I'm saying basically he was offended by this right and the only money he ever gave her was 200 bucks for a night out and he like gave that back to her so you know it kind of depends on who you believe I tend to believe him because I mean let's be honest here she's not the most reliable of sources now this is where the plan gets hatched again, but this time between Daniel and Jennifer to orchestrate what we see, you know, happening. Now, another dynamic that we will also hear about is the insurance. So Jennifer would stand to gain a lot of insurance money, right? And we'll talk more about this when Felix takes the stand. Um, and, and really all he'll say on the stand is he didn't know about this until all this happened, right? Uh, and he didn't really want to know about that when this took place because that's not, he didn't care about that, right? I mean, he's more concerned with what most people would be like, oh my God. Yeah, like we just lost her mother, right? So there's a lot of money at stake to be had. Now, of course, this never went as planned, obviously, because the father lived and we know, we know what happened. But nonetheless, you can kind of start seeing all this plotting and planning and all this take place. All of this motive, money, wanting to be with Daniel, wanting to escape all this pressure, it all comes back to Jennifer. Now, it would be Daniel who hooked Jennifer up. Remember how I said that he, you know, got her these little burner phones and that kind of thing for them to talk and whatnot? So, he would end up hooking her up with the contact, and this would be Limford, aka Homeboy. Um, and this is who she would reach out to and be like, hey there, I was just curious to know uh, what the going rate is for a contract killing. Uh, you know, I'm just always curious, like, how does that even 
even come up. You know what I mean? Like, I would never even, first of all, I'd never think to do that, to ask somebody that. But then even in that world, and maybe it's just because we hear the squad and all that, we watch the stuff, I would just assume everybody's a damn cop, right? I would never even think to ask somebody that. Or if they weren't a cop, they would go and tell on me right away. Anyways. So, he tells her it's like, normally like 20 grand or something like that, but for a friend of Daniel's, We'll cut it in half. So with this plan in tow, you know, they scout the neighborhood out, they start planning all this up, yada yada, and, and things start to roll in. So then remember how I said that Daniel has been like seeing this girl and kind of dangling Jen and like the friend zone and this weird stuff and all that? Okay. So he'll end up having this conversation with her where he's like, look, babe, I really feel the same way for her that I do you. And this, you know, we already know Jennifer, she's got some stuff going on, right? So this doesn't go well. So this makes Jen say, so what, you know, this is what's going on. Well, then call off the whole situation with homeboy. Okay. Which makes Daniel then kind of be like, well, look, I thought you were doing this for you, right? It's this weird, passive, aggressive, you know, uh, oh, I thought you were doing this for you, but it would be nice if she, if the parents were there. I mean, it's very weird, right? I mean, I definitely think that he emotionally manipulated her. Now, I'm not trying to say that he's to blame or anything like that, but... I'm just saying that there was definitely like some icky toxic stuff going on there. Obviously, look at what happened. Now also, let's remember back to, remember when the cop was talking to Jennifer in the interrogation room? And he was all like, uh, you know, when did you talk to Daniel last? And she's trying to play it off like, oh, well, I saw him yesterday when I was leaving here at, you know, the station. So, yeah, that is true. I did see him. And he's like, you haven't talked to him. And she was like, ooh. She got stuck, right? Well, there's this, I mean, they're texting back and forth. I mean, th th this whole lie that we haven't talked and all this stuff, it's a complete lie. And then she knows she's been texting between him and Limford and all these people plotting the demise of her parents, right? And then this whole weird, I don't even want to call it a love triangle, but a love triangle in essence, right? Because all during this time, even though uh, uh, Daniel would sit here and say, well, I feel the same way about Christine that I do you, in the next breath, he would be flirting with Jen and coming back to her. I mean, it was just, it was so bizarre. So regardless, I mean, you see where lie after lie after lie and how she was getting caught up in this and in those interrogation rooms and tapes and you know, the interviews. I mean, she's getting called out on this and that's where she's just like, I don't know what to do. Now, one of the guys that was in on the situation, David, he would sit here and say, he was like, no, I didn't sign up for all that, right? I thought this was like a home invasion and that's the way he played it, but it didn't pan out that way for him, right? And also Eric, and I'm just gonna scroll up here real quick. So remember Eric, while I was talking about uh, Eric Cardi, AKA Sniper. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, he was already charged with like another murder. He had shot a guy in the chest, he'd run off. He already had stuff going on, right? And so, so a lot of the lawyers would try and blame him, but actually none of the co-defendants actually would rat on each other. It was very interesting uh, because usually in these situations they will kind of, you know, like completely just point fingers and whatnot. Um, so there was that and even Jen tried to say it wasn't them. So now the gentleman that he had shot, his name was Kirk Matthews, like I said, and this was in 2009 of December. Uh, and the dude was getting out of his vehicle after he'd been visiting his mother's home in Toronto when the attack took place. So and we'll get to what ended up up happening with these co-defendants and whatnot here in a minute. So when it comes to the trial, obviously I don't have footage of that or anything, but reading about some of the stuff that I did, I wanted to talk about some of the key components that really stood out to me during this. Obviously, one of those is going to be when the father takes the stand. I mean, can you imagine? After all of the stuff you have been through, you have survived through this, and you are taking the stand against your own daughter, against your own flesh and blood for trying to take you out and for having taken your wife out, right? I just, I can't imagine. So he was allegedly very stoic on the stand. Um, and also, you know, we sit here and this is where the, you learn about the life insurance policies and it was supposed to be split evenly between the brother and sister. Remember she had that younger brother, Felix. Um, and he would say that he did feel that all wasn't really right with the story of Jennifer and what the story meaning 
all the lies and all that kind of stuff. Like he could tell that it was like something's not adding up, but his wife, Bic, she didn't want him to interfere. And she just kind of wanted things to just, you know, settle, right? But he said that one day when he found out about her staying with someone else, uh, that kind of led him to force her to make this decision of, look, it's your family or, or Daniel, right? You need to, one way or the other kind of situation. And we all know which one she chose. She did choose her family. But we clearly see that that decision ate away at her. And also, he will confirm to the court that, yeah, you know what? On the night of this took place, I did see her talking to these uh, uh, intruders uh, like they were her friends. Yeah. You know? And so this answers your question why he ran from the house, why he didn't go back to Jim when she was calling for him. He knew, right? He knew. And probably what happened, which is really even sad, you know how like we talk about in these cases where these parents in their last moments of life have this realization of this ultimate betrayal by their own children and whatnot. So probably in that moment, all these thoughts that he had along the way of like, is Jen lying about this? And is, you know, is this that? Or is this that? Or these doubts and that kind of thing. It probably all came crashing down to him and it all just clicked into place, you know. Now remember, he was injured. He did get shot. It just didn't kill him, right? So he has a physical trauma going on then at the same time as well. It's not just, you know, this oh, I've nearly survived that in the adrenaline rush of us. I mean, there is that going on too, right? But nonetheless, it was probably this gut-wrenching realization of, you know, just a, literally a sucker punch. And I don't blame him. I would have run from the damn house too and definitely have left her behind. It's why he's still alive. Now, this video wouldn't be a video without talking about Jen's time on the stand. True to form for Jen... Again, you just can't believe a damn word she says, and it's completely cringe, right? Now, again, I did not see her testimony, but just reading what I did, I was just like, yeah, this is what I would expect out of it. So we're just going to talk about a few key points of that that stood out to me. So one of the things that she did on the stand is she does what she does best, and that is lie. And again, at this point, you don't really know what the truth is, but you can kind of look at the evidence and look at what the factual things point to, and then what Jen says. So what she'll do is she'll spin yet another tale. And in this one, it the, the, the tale that she has woven and spun for this is she has removed herself a little bit more from accountability by saying, I was actually trying to hire someone to take me out, you know, because I couldn't do that myself. It would bring too much shame, so on and so forth. And basically this was all not meant to happen and go down this way. Now, she would say that she got really angry, really pissed when her parents began to isolate her and ignore her. And that once she got in trouble, once she was like found out for those initial lies and that kind of a thing, that this behavior got worse. And so obviously you can imagine her feelings got worse as well. Now, she would say that most of these feelings were directed towards her father. Now, on the stand is where she'll spend the tale that I told you about the original plan of paying someone $1,500 to take her father out, but she got ripped off for the money. So, again, this is all new, and the gentleman who, like I said previously, were like, uh, yeah, uh, or the guy, not the gentleman. Uh, he's a gentleman, maybe, I don't know, but what I mean is this is just one person I'm talking about, for God's sakes. He was saying, you know, he, she lent me 200 bucks, and I gave it right back to her when I saw I was going to be drama for God's sakes. So do I believe her or him? Him completely, right? I mean, I just, I don't trust this girl. So she goes back to the story of taking herself and she's like, you know what? If I took myself out, it would be too much shame in the family, right? But hiring somebody, that's okay. And the cost was 10 grand, right? Now 10 grand, didn't we hear that number before? So you see where she hits these key points. And so then she's like, but I changed my mind and I didn't want to do it anymore, but there was going to be a cancellation fee, but I couldn't come up with a cancellation fee. And I'm just like, my God, I mean, this, I mean, my God. She needed to be a damn fiction writer is what she needed to be. Now, what she would say is that because she couldn't come up with this fee the night that the crime occurred, she just assumed that these guys that showed up were the dudes, like, coming to collect that cancellation fee. So it was almost like oh, somebody's going to be losing their life. And I'm just like, that is the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. But again, 
she's desperate. She's come up with anything she can think of at this point. She is at the end of her rope with lies and there's just no more lies to be told. Like literally if there's a bucket of lies and it was on the ground and you reached in there after she got done with it, you'd be like, oh my God, somebody died through the bucket. There's like a 50 foot hole in the ground of nothingness. And you know, like Jen's been digging in the damn bucket, okay? Now, as I say a lot of times with most of these cases, spoiler alert, she was guilty, okay? <laughs> She didn't make it past the word go on this one. It didn't matter how much she lied. It didn't matter how she tried to spin the story. It didn't matter how much she tried to look sweet and innocent. The story that was told and the evidence that spoke told a gruesome and heartless and cold story of a girl who took her or attempted to take both her parents out, right? By hiring people to do it and succeeded and won, right? And so, and this would be the case with all of them, okay? They were all found guilty. Now, there's four defendants and it took the jury four days. Each of them were found guilty on both charges of first degree M and attempted M. Now, Jennifer would get 25 years, no parole, and like the year 2036 or 2039, somewhere around there is when she is first eligible for parole. Now, one thing that's interesting is talking about Eric, uh, and we're gonna kind of go a little bit down into his situation because he would end up taking a plea deal where he would admit to stuff and it's probably I don't want to say the closest to truth because you never know right but we'll talk about this for a little bit so he had a mistrial right and so he ends up getting 25 years remember he already murdered somebody else right so for Kirk Matthews he gets 25 years he ends up cutting a deal for the Jennifer situation and he gets 18 years for that scenario right so he'll have to admit to certain aspects of the crime in order to get the deal. And so I'm gonna to refer to my notes right here because he does admit to these things that we're about to review over here in regards to the pan situation. So this is what he admits to, the following story basically. That he's first contacted by Linford in the early hours of October 27th and Linford explains that Jen's plans, he explains Jen's plans and he agreed to help. He was supposed to recruit people to enter the home provide the vehicle and show up to the pan home on the night that it was supposed to happen. Later that day, he started looking for a rental car but was unable to, uh, so they were planning to do this on Halloween. Uh, Linford drove there with Daniel while Linford continued looking for an accomplice. Eric contacted David and David would get a five, David would get five grand a piece for doing this. Uh, now the new date was set for November 3rd to take, to do the situation. Eric demanded two grand in cash to be handed over at the pan house upon arrival. So interesting. Eric couldn't find enough gas money though to get there, but and Jen, Jen can but Jen canceled the plan. I'm just like, are you kidding me? Um, but then it was decided that it would take place November 8th. So Eric would admit to him and David and one other man loaded into a car and called Jen on the way telling her to unlock the door. Remember she left the door unlocked? Uh, three men entered the home armed with a gun and 15 minutes later they left. That is all he would admit to. He would not admit to being in the home. Okay, so very interesting on that, right? And so they, they each end up getting these sentences here. Now also interesting about Eric Cardi is uh, back in 2018, he died in prison. So, and I'm just referring to my notes here about it. So he was 38 years old of Rexdale. He passed on April 26th at the Kent Institution. He was being held on two convictions there. Um, and one of them obviously was Jennifer Pan's mother and the other was Kirk Matthews. Now the article does say that following his sentencing he was stabbed in prison and that there's been a number of theories about how he met his fate however an autopsy has yet to be completed so very interesting I mean this happens a lot of times in these situations it does sound like this guy was doing a whole bunch of dirty deeds out there so I mean this might not be a big surprise or whatever um, so there's that so like I said the they all got the, the same convictions in this and whatever uh, 25 years before they can be eligible for parole and so we'll see what happens. I mean, I tend to think, depending on what it is, that Canadian court systems and that kind of thing seem to be a little bit more lenient and more about rehabilitation than we see here in America. So it'll be interesting to see what, you know, has Jennifer been doing anything in the meantime? Now, there are a couple of other little things I'm going to talk about real quick before we wrap this video up. And let's just get to them now. So Jennifer's been at the Grand Valley Institution for Women. And like I said, around 2039 is going to be her first shot at getting out. 
So we're just gonna have to see if he's even, if she's even able to do that. Um, I mean, who knows? <sighs> I don't know what kind of a future she could possibly have. I mean, she's going to be away for a while if she's learned to function and do stuff. But I mean, my God, her whole life was built on a lie, right? I mean, everything she did was just fake and not, not you know, not on the up and up or whatever. And so then that, her way to solve it was to take her parents out. So, I, I mean, I'm not sure. Do you come back from that, right? Because, I mean, this wasn't like a young, young person that did this, right? So we'll see, we'll see what happens. It will definitely be something to follow. Um, overall, I thought about this case with Jennifer specifically. Yeah, like I said, and I kind of probably hinted at this throughout the video. Yeah, there was parts of me that I was like, you know what, I can see how she, that level of pressure and stress could have gotten to her, right? I can appreciate that. Um, it doesn't sound like a fun life, right? I get that. I get those feelings as a youth and being in love and then that being taken away. All that. I get it. Um, many people go through this. Also, many people don't choose to kill their parents over it. So I don't have any sympathy for her with that. Um, I just feel like if she was tricky enough to pull all this conniving stuff that she was doing to lie about school and lie about this and lie about that, it's like, why not do that to seek out some kind of help behind your parents' back? You know what I'm saying? I feel like there was other options than having your parents taken out. You know, I just, it's, it just seems so extreme and so psycho. So I, I, she has no sympathies for me with that. Right. And then going to the underworld and like hiring these people and doing all this crazy stuff. I mean, these secret lives that these kids leave that leave their parents dead, just, it, it baffles me to no belief. Um, and, and you know, strict household or not, it's no excuse to take your parents out. So anyways, if you are still here, Thank you for watching. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who makes the Sofa Squad possible. It wouldn't be here without you. Show some love to the victims, the survivors, down in the comment section. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for keeping their, these stories alive, their memories alive. And thank you for sitting through me for this damn long-ass video. Uh, I'm not sure if this is part one or two, so whichever part it is, I appreciate you sitting here and making it through like a damn trooper. And anyways, till we get there, back around this damn sofa or that damn computer over there. Whoosh! I'll see you soon.